I wasn't sure that I was going to do a, another response video to Brian. Um, and if you didn't check out the first video, haven't seen it yet, I would suggest you go back and uh, watch that first because it'll give some background to um, what I'm going to talk about here. But after reviewing Brian's um, second two-part uh, of his video of why he never became Eastern Orthodox, I thought you know, he's brought up some additional points and uh, they deserve a response. Brian is you know, at, at going to some lengths to indicate that he, he has no particular beef with orthodoxy, he's not trying to attack orthodoxy. He said before in his prior video, he's not an apologist, he's not a historian. And that's all perfectly fine. He's giving his personal take on it. Nevertheless, he's giving it very publicly. And uh, that means that it more it, you know, by default, it's an apologetic for Roman Catholicism. And it's reasonable to uh, try to give the other side of the story. And, um, and so that's what I'm going to do. So in the Eastern Orthodox churches, as I understand them, they would say that their universality is expressed in their common theology, their orthodoxy. But the question for me has always been, how is that common theology defined? How do you make sure as new difficulties and controversies arise that the entire church responds to address them? So this is a good question. And uh, it's one that uh, it often comes up in... Um, questions about Roman Catholicism versus Eastern Orthodoxy. How does Eastern Orthodoxy come up with a, uh, a unified, consistent, um, you know, set of dogma uh, doctrines uh, b between the different churches um, without seemingly having this, uh, you know, central figure of, uh, you know, a single bishop that kind of dictates these things. And, uh, and the answer is quite simply the way that the church uh, did it in the first millennium over and over again. Uh, and in fact, the way that Brian will reference here in a second, which is that um, the churches get together in council. Um, when there is an obvious uh, issue, a difference of doctrine or practice between the churches, uh, some, something that needs to be worked out, um, the, the churches, the churches get together in council. Um, so it, it literally is just as simple as that. And, um, and a person who looks at the history of the first, uh, the first millennium will see that this is the guiding practice of the church. This is how they, they managed to maintain consistency among themselves. Uh, even when the Bishop of Rome was a part of the communion, um, the, the, there was never a time period where you will find, if you look back in history, uh, that a, a doctrinal crisis comes up, some issue occurs, and they, they say, okay, let's all drop everything and head to Rome. We'll just ask the Bishop of Rome what he thinks. Um, that's never the case in the early church. Um, uh, I mean, outside of the, the actual environs of Rome and, and the, you know, the, the diocese of Rome, more or less, um, which is perfectly in accordance with the way the orthodoxy... <clears throat> Uh, see the church. Um, outside of that, you never see this happening. So uh, that's the simple answer is uh, you get together, you have a council, and the church receives it. Well, if there's no one final authority like we have in the Pope, then you'd need an ecumenical council where all the bishops and patriarchs get together to define doctrines and settle controversies. I think anyone who uh, looks at the the Catholic Church would, would with reasonable, uh, you know, with a reasonable judgment say yeah the roman catholic church even with the the so-called unifying factor of the single uh, supreme bishop of the bishop of rome um is not without its doctrinal difficulties uh in fact it's it's the western roman church that ends up spawning the reformation now is that the roman church's fault uh, you know yeah you know there's some debate to be had there um certainly corruption within the the roman church ended up spawning the reformation um, the Reformation, you know, may be responsible on its own for how much it splintered past that point. But nevertheless, um, merely having the Bishop of Rome doesn't seem to actually, um, in effect, create the same sort of doctrinal unity that oftentimes is claimed for it um, by, by Roman Catholic apologists. The, uh, um, the, the reality is different, you know, than, than, than the theory. Um, but yeah, uh, as Brian says, um, you know, you, you, if you don't have the Bishop of Rome, what do you have to do? <clears throat> uh, you have to uh, call ecumenical councils and, and get everybody together. And, and he's right on. But for the Eastern Orthodox as we know them today, there hasn't been an ecumenical council in over a thousand years. And what was it that happened a thousand years ago? I'm trying to remember. Hmm. 
Meanwhile, Rome hasn't stopped calling and hosting ecumenical councils with representation from throughout the world. So there's something about the Eastern Orthodox churches to me that keeps them frozen and unable to reaffirm the universality of our faith without that one unifying voice that brings them all together. So a, a couple of thoughts about this. Um, first of all, no, the Orthodox Church did not stop having councils. Um, the Orthodox Church has had plenty of councils, plenty of of get-togethers between um, the Eastern Church patriarchs, and um, and there there was no particular need to have the Bishop of Rome there in order to have them. Um, it, you know, it, it was instructive to look back in history. You know, he says, well, you know, they didn't have the Bishop of Rome there to to you know to call a council. How could you possibly have an ecumenical council? Um, well, the Bishop of Rome never called ecumenical councils. That that's kind of the dirty little secret of the, the the way the Roman Catholic Church sees ecumenical councils now versus the reality of what they were um, in the the first millennium. The ecumenical councils were always called by the uh, Byzantine emperor, always held in the Eastern Church. The Pope never attended. Um, he did send uh, his own legates to it, his representatives. Um, but they weren't called ecumenical because they were called by the Pope um, or, or somehow organized by, by the Western Church. They're called ecumenical, more or less ecumenical, uh, basically means of the empire. It's, it's kind of referring to the Roman Empire at the time. It was a council of the empire. You never had an ecumenical council until Christianity was legalized. Um, you know, and, and Constantine calls the first council. Uh, it's not at that point that you have a, an ecumenical council. Is that the first time the church had a council or had a universal council, a binding council? Absolutely not. You have the first one in Acts 15. Uh, the council of Jerusalem is called. The apostles are all there. Um, Peter, by the way, does not preside, nor does he call the council. It's called by the, the presiding bishop of, of Jerusalem at the time, which is James, and presided by James, not Peter. Um, n uh, you know, was that not a binding council because um, it was not called ecumenical? No, absolutely not. Um, so it, it's 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 much too um, much too shallow of a fixation to just say, well, if you, if you can't have a council which is labeled ecumenical, then um, somehow there's some deficiency in your church. Um, there's not. Um, the Orthodox Church doesn't tech, doesn't doesn't call its councils ecumenical councils anymore. Um, I don't personally. Um, uh, I think the label as it's currently used, which more or less has come to, to mean kind of, you know, just like, oh, it's a world council, probably would be reasonable to use it again, since it's kind of a terminology that people are familiar with. Um, but we don't, we don't call it that. Um, just had a, a council uh, a couple of years ago called, you know, the, the, the council, it was in Crete, I think, and, and just labeled as the, the Pan-Orthodox Council. You know, just, you know, it's it's all the Orthodox churches. Um, it's a controversial council. I'm not suggesting that one uh, will hold up. Looks like it looks like it might not um, hold up as as a legit council that's accepted by everybody. Um, I you know only time will tell. We'll see. But nevertheless, um, not having a bishop of Rome is no particular bar for the Orthodox Church to have councils. Um, uh, most famously, uh, there is an absolutely universally binding council. Um, that occurred um, at the time of, of Gregory Palamas in the uh, the 1300s. Um, uh, uh, council is in uh, Constantinople, I believe. Um, that that is um, while I mean I guess some people might call it an ecumenical council, but in general, it, I don't believe it is. Uh, it's typically referred to as an ecumenical council. But you won't find any Orthodox church anywhere that does not consider this council to be binding. Um, so there you go. Proof positive. Um, certainly the, uh, the Orthodox church has ecumenical style councils, but not having, uh, not having a Byzantine empire to, uh, to kind of, you know, organize and, uh, and tie those councils to, we just don't call them ecumenical councils anymore. So it's just, it's kind of a meaningless point. And that ability, I think, would have been incredibly useful for the East. You can't rely on ancient or early medieval councils to address something like Marxism, which has been devastating on the East. And isn't it amazing that one of the most significant voices that contributed to the downfall of communism in the East was the Pope of Rome? I don't have a whole lot to say on this point other than the, the Eastern Orthodox Church has had absolutely no problem with 
uh, with dealing with the issue of Marxism and, and, and standing firm against it or calling it out as the, the abominable philosophy that it was. Um, I'm glad that the Pope uh, spoke out against it. It's fantastic. Many people did. Um, but I, I don't think that necessarily gives him any like particular special brownie points for that. Um, Eastern Orthodox Church is the one that, that, that died and fought against it uh, from the inside. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't need a council for that. As a simple convert to Christianity and then eventually Catholicism, it's never been easy for someone like me to evaluate the complex history and theology that frames these controversies. So when I was looking at the differences between Protestantism and Catholicism, I felt like I needed a simple and accessible way to resolve that debate in my mind. And it was provided in a few different areas, but especially in the Protestant idea that scripture is the only infallible authority on faith and morals. For that to be true, it would have to be taught in scripture, which it wasn't. So it was obviously self-refuting. I, I actually like this idea of Brian's that um, you know it, it, it is helpful to be able to boil down these complex issues into a simple way um, of, of seeing kind of what is the core problem. Um, and I also would agree with Brian that the core problem uh, with, with Protestantism is this, this idea of sola scriptura. It is non-scriptural. Um, it is anti-historical, um, and it is, I think, the primary poison at the heart of why Protestantism just instantaneously fractured. It has it has no ecclesiology because of this 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 idea of sola scriptura. It forcibly you know, strips the church of its identity and being. So, um, so Brian is is quite right here, and I agree with him. So in the case of the East-West Schism, I've always similarly tried to find a simple and accessible argument that was self-refuting. And I felt like I found that in the Eastern position, which is what I was trying to communicate in last week's video. So um, I'm not going to rehash my entire critique of of Brian's first video, first video here. Um, he, Brian, in his first video, had some, some misunderstandings about how the Eastern Orthodox church, uh, understands what the, the church is and what the Bishop of Rome's place was and, and how, you know, how things unfolded. So he had a kind of a theory of what the Eastern position is and how that might play out. Um, I think he also had some confusion, uh, about what excommunication was, or maybe how often breaks in communion happen between different churches uh, throughout history. And, um, and, and this just caused him to kind of, kind of, I think just kind of get off on the wrong trail in terms of what the actual, the actual, you know, argument that the Eastern Orthodox church kind of is having with, um, the, the, the Bishop of Rome and the Western church. Um, so, you know, go back and look at the first video for a full critique of that. Now you might say that it's a superficial argument, and maybe it is, but I don't think you can really ask for more of your average layperson when it comes to the things that they can grasp and make sense of. A concept like the filioque is so far removed from the lives of your average Christian that it's just not the kind of thing that you're going to get that we're going to get hung up on. So trying to sort through that theology isn't where I focus my attention. I think that's a reasonable nuance that Brian brings out there. You know, how much is it reasonable for everyone to get into the intricacies of the filioque? It's a complicated question, and uh, and it's it's controversial inside of Eastern Orthodoxy. Is it possible for the filioque clause being added to the the creed? Is it possible for it to be understood in a way that um, would satisfy Eastern Orthodox uh, theology and you know, depending on who you ask, you know, you're going to get different answers. I think probably you with sufficient amounts of guardrails put in place or, you know, the right explanations. Sure. I think the filioque can be understood in, in the right way. Um, and I think largely when you, when you boil down the actual argument about the filioque, it's not really at root, uh, or at least kind of the beginning of the question is not, is it something that can be uh, theologically accurate. The problem with the filioque clause being added is that it was added unilaterally, that 
the the Nicene Creed, Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, was set out as the gold standard symbol of the faith, and in multiple ecumenical councils, it was uh, it was said that it was not allowed for anyone to alter that creed, that anyone who did so was anathema, and the Western Church knew this, and the Western Church um, actually avoided even past the point where the filioque clause was being bandied around, which is happening, I think, in, in the 500s. I'm going off memory here, but um, in Spain, uh, begin to be be kind of thrown in 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 usage as um, as a, a, a you know a means of fighting Arianism, which is perfectly fine, um, but uh, you know hadn't really come to be. Um, uh, widely utilized until um, around the 800s. And it's at that time, the Pope of the time, which again, off memory, I believe was Pope Leo III. Um, he, uh, he, he in, in letters of the time, more or less indicates that he's okay with the theology of it, but he says you can't add it into the creed. You'll destroy the church. You'll, you'll split the church. You'll schism things. Uh, maybe not destroy the church, but but he he recognized at the time that adding to the creed, adding this to the creed, was absolutely not something that could be done. Um, and he has the creed written, um, written up in original form, inscribed in silver plaques, posted on on the front door, I believe, of St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, might be wrong about that, but um, but in any case, he 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 firmly indicates at that time an understanding that you don't mess with the creed. You certainly don't do it unilaterally, um, and um, and and doing that unilaterally two hundred years later is what causes the the Patriarch of Constantinople to um, stop celebrating uh, or recognizing the Bishop of Rome in um, in in the liturgy. Uh, so kind of recognizing there's a break of communion at that time. Not 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 talking about the same thing as as the the you know. The, the dual excommunications that go on in 1054, this happens prior to that. Um, so there, there already was a break of communion prior to that. The, the unfortunate circumstance of 1054 is a different thing. But, um, but it, it's, you know, as Brian says, it's a complicated issue. The theology of it is a complicated issue. I think it is clearer merely just looking at the actual, the, the act of adding to the creed as the, the, uh, the, the, the real, um, you know, act of of violence that was done against the church by the bishop of Rome by by mandating that that be added into the creed in the Latin Mass, um, effectively altering the worship of the church. Um, that he uh, that he stepped too far. It was not something that that he had the right to do. The bishop uh, the bishop of Rome in the eight hundreds knew this and um, and knew that this was a mistake to do this um and so the that that was the, that's the problem with the filioque um and that's uh, you know maybe as much as needs to be known about it i was interested in trying to discern which church stayed true to the very thing that they were contending in that original division and so the eastern bishops were contending that the bishop of rome was a first among equals but not supreme in authority but the East excommunicated the Bishop of Rome and haven't once shown him that kind of honor since then. So in my opinion, that's a pretty obvious example of them betraying their own position. Uh, Brian's recapping his argument from his first video again. So to recap my, my, <laughs> my argument against his argument from the first video again, Brian misunderstands the, the Eastern Orthodox understanding of the church uh, he misunderstands the meaning of primacy and he misunderstands the excommunication or, or what actually occurred there. So going into a little more detail, um, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, holds that the, the Bishop of Rome does have a primacy, uh, a primacy of honor. It did have an actual authority of the early church. Um, no doubt about this. And, and no one really, uh, really contests this. Um, and, uh, it, it makes it a little hard to, uh, to fully explain our position because it requires some nuance. Uh, it's so much easier to just be able to say, oh, the Bishop of Rome had no authority, no authority whatsoever. Um, but that's not true. The Bishop of Rome did have authority. It was granted by councils. Um, 
it was not understood to be some sort of, of uh, you know, supreme authority. Um, he, uh, the Council of, of Sardica granted um, uh, the Bishop of Rome kind of a, like an, an appellate right. You know, if, if you thought that you'd been done dirty, you know, by your bishop or, or your your synod, your local synod, there was a right to appeal to the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome could kind of reopen the case. Um, but nowhere in any of the councils or any of the things that, that the powers that were granted to the Bishop of Rome um, was uh, any sort of authority to um, place bishops to to say, hey, you know, the, you know, a, you know, here here's the person I want to be the bishop in X Y Z city, um, which is the current case with the the Bishop of Rome now. Um, pretty much ever since the the schism, um, that was a power that was taken up by the Bishop of Rome. Doesn't exist in the first millennium. Um, so this sort of supreme or, or universal jurisdiction, um, the supreme authority to um, dictate uh, doctrine um, and morals doesn't exist in the first millennium. Um, you don't you don't find instances. I, I referenced this earlier, but but you go back, you look at history, you see how were things dealt with, and over and over again, you have problems. You have a synod. They get together, they talk it out. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the synod. Um, it's not the bigger the problem, the more they go to Rome. This is this is the model that you would expect from the Roman Catholic understanding of, of the, the makeup of the church today. But this is not the way the church worked in the first millennium. It's just not. Um, the bishop, but, but it is absolutely true. You will go back and you will find the Bishop of Rome uh, uh, exercising a position of authority. Uh, the Bishop of Rome was considered to be the first C, the kind of the, the Eastern Orthodox would say the first among equals. So all bishops are equal, but nevertheless, in organizational terms, there is a first. It's kind of like being on a board of a, of a, you know, of a company or a parish council or something, you know, you're, you know, uh, the parish council that, that is at my parish, you know, there's a whole bunch of parish council members, um, you know, and there is a president of the parish council. The president runs the meeting, uh, does the agenda, you know, kind of directs conversation and things like that. Does the president get extra votes? No. Does the president veto things? Nope. But the president is kind of first among equals. Um, very similar in, in the way that the Bishop of Rome acts in the early church. Um, and, uh, and, and this, you know, this this is is fair i think fairly clear in history um if you look at roman catholic apologetic sites you're going to find this kind of the standard quote mining thing going on but um if you want a good historic treatment a historian a roman catholic historian actually who will give a pretty reasonable picture of the issue uh i reckon i recommend francis dvornik d-v-o-r-n-i-k um uh, he has a book um, should have should have looked to see what the title was. Um, Byzantium and the Roman Primacy, I think is what it's called. Um, really good book. Um, pretty fair treatment, and it's gonna it's gonna give kind of the the you know it's gonna give both sides of the coin. It's gonna try to kind of trace out the the sweep of the question of the primacy and how that that worked out. Um, it's a pretty decent. That's a pretty decent take on it. Um, I, I'm, I'm suggesting a Roman Catholic writer because I think uh, that will hold a little more weight perhaps for Brian or for other people who who are looking into the question. Um, certainly there's uh, some excellent Eastern Orthodox books that would, would trace that out as well or talk about the issue of the primacy. Um, but I mean, maybe you'd say, well, they're Eastern Orthodox. Of course, they're going to be more polemic. Um, if you want to check some out... Um, there's, uh, there's a book that's edited by uh, Father Meyendorf, and I think it's called, uh, what is it called, Peter and the Primacy? Uh, P, uh, something along those lines, but but it's, it's edited by, by Meyendorf, M M E Y E N D O R F F. Um, that's a pretty good one. Um, it's not polemical, it's just it's a collection of, of more kind of scholarly um, articles, um, and that's a, that's a pretty decent, pretty decent take on it. Um, another thing, um, I guess to, to bring up is, uh, you know, Brian ha ha is preferring a theory that says that the Eastern Orthodox church, you know, 
said the Bishop of Rome had had a a position of primacy, uh, but then they excommunicate him, and this this more or less kind of breaks their own theory. Um, on a technical note, I'd say the Eastern Orthodox Church never excommunicated the Bishop of Rome, uh, nor did the Bishop of Rome excommunicate the Eastern Orthodox Churches in in an official kind of excommunication. What actually happened at the time of the schism is that, um, and I mentioned this earlier, the the Bishop of Rome uh, around a thousand A.D. Um, uh, mandated the beginning of the use of the filioque in the the creed in the Latin Mass. And um, when news of this uh, came to the East, the Patriarch of Constantinople removed the Bishop of Rome from what are called the diptychs. The diptychs, um, this is, uh, and this happens with, with the uh, all the, the major patriarchies, is in the the liturgies where the patriarch is presiding over the liturgy. These would be called hierarchical liturgies. Um, so they're, they're liturgies where, you know, the bishop is, is engaged there. In, in this case, patriarchal liturgies. Um, they will have a list of the bishops that they are in communion with, that they'll, they'll read out uh, as part of the liturgy. I've never actually seen this in practice. I would imagine this could take some time. I don't know how they make it work. But in any case, this is, this is kind of the... Um, mechanism by which you can tell if a church is in communion with another church, if a church is, um, you know, you know, recognizing other churches as good to go. Um, and this is not the first time the Bishop of Rome is removed from the diptychs. This has happened uh, a couple of times in centuries prior to this. So this is not an uncommon occurrence per se. And it's not just the Bishop of Rome that receives this treatment. This is pretty much kind of standard practice, particularly in Constantinople, uh, first millennium church, when they recognize that there is a communion issue. And I'm saying communion kind of like the relational sense. There is a problem um, is they will stop commemorating the bishop that more or less kind of the offending bishop until things get sorted out. Um, and this is what happens to the Bishop of Rome. Um, but this is not a rejection of Rome, uh, Rome, the Western Christians as Christians per se, nor is it a, a rejection of Roman primacy in the Eastern Orthodox sense of the terms. Um, it is a recognition by specifically the Patriarch of Constantinople that there is something wrong with the practice of Christianity by the Bishop of Rome. Um, and that's it. This is, uh, you know, this, this, you know, we, we like to point at 1054, these dueling excommunications that again, is not the East excommunicating the Bishop of Rome or the Bishop of Rome excommunicating the East. Um, there's much more targeted, you know, um, excommunications that occur. We say, oh, well, that's, that's the point. 1054, that's the schism. But it, in the reality, it's not. Uh, the schism is something that plays out over really kind of the next 100, 150 years before, um, you know, kind of, really before it, it gets kind of nailed down to the point at which the 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 differences in the Eastern and Western churches have grown to such a degree that it, it's kind of just it's hard to backtrack off of those, you know. And with the failure of the two reunion councils in particular, it's just kind of you know the door is nailed shut that. This is this is a permanent thing now, um, but prior to that, it, it wasn't just some some you know uh, you know kick kick out of the bishop of Rome, and uh, and be done with it, um, and and also just like I say, this is um, there there's other indications that um, this this idea that the bishop of Rome is somehow like unexcommunicate unexcommunicable. Um, doesn't really hold up in history. The Bishop of Rome um, ha- is excommunicated prior to this time uh, a few times. Um, and, uh, you know, once that I can think of, he's excommunicated by people in his own diocese. Uh, there's a there's a synod of African bishops that at one point excommunicate the Bishop of Rome um, for things that they think are, are irregular in, in his practice. Um I mean, his, his, his own bishops, more or less, excommunicate him. But in terms of the bigger one, the the gold standard, you know, of you know popes acting badly and getting literally excommunicated and anathematized uh, is Pope Honorius. Pope Honorius the first, 
Um, like who was who was Pope Honorius the second? Who would want to take that name up after what happened to the Pope Honorius the first? Who uh, in the fifth council, fifth council, um, fifth or sixth, is um, is declared to be a heretic, um, having the the council declares him a heretic, says that he has taught heresy, which completely breaks modern uh, Roman. A Catholic understanding of the capacity of the Bishop of Rome to teach error. They say it's impossible for him to do so. Well, not according to the councils. Um, this one's almost kind of funny to watch Roman Catholic apologists um, deal with. There is a lot of tap dancing that occurs when you start talking about Honorius. You know, well, he wasn't really a heretic. He didn't really teach heresy because that would completely break um, their understanding of the, the, the Pope's inability to do so. Um, nevertheless, you just, the ecumenical council, this is not a local council. This is not just the Eastern churches, you know, pitching a hissy fit. The ecumenical council says the Pope taught heresy. He was a heretic taught heresy. He's deposed. He is anathematized for this. The succeeding popes for centuries uh, not only accept this, so he's like, well, you know, it, it was this just the Eastern? It's just the Eastern people throwing a fit. We don't care about them. No, no, the popes accepted this. That Pope Honorius was a heretic. They accepted the Ecumenical Council and its rendering. Um, and uh, to the degree to which it was, uh, you know, his his anathema, anathematizing was added to the papal oath. It was taken for centuries. The popes, as they became popes and took their papal oath, had to re-anathematize Pope Honorius. Um, the party line nowadays is Pope Honorius didn't really teach heresy, um, and he wasn't really he wasn't really uh, chastised by the Ecumenical Council for teaching heresy. It was just that he wasn't vigilant in stamping out heresy. Okay, this is not what the Ecumenical Council says. First of all, it says he taught heresy. Okay, so you have to accept what the council says, regardless of whether you think he taught heresy or not. The council said he did. Um, and uh, how likely do you think it is that a pope would be called a heretic, anathematized, anathematized in an ecumenical council, and that his anathematization would be added to the papal oath? If the extent of what he was guilty of was just not being vigilant enough, I do not buy that for a second. Pope Honorius is a heretic, declared so by an ecumenical council, accepted by the popes for centuries. I'm sorry if this breaks Roman Catholic uh, understanding of the infallibility of the pope and his inability to teach error, but it's just not true. The pope can teach error, the pope can be excommunicated. And kicked out of the church. And even though the Eastern Church at the time of the schism did not excommunicate the Pope, um, nevertheless, had it done so, it would not have, have been uh, something that was that was um, completely counter to their understanding of church or, or to um, historical precedent. This has happened before this time. So, um, so Brian's theory about what it was the Eastern Church um, was holding forth, kind of, you know, the, the, the position of the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, is not the real position. He, he has, unfortunately, very much misunderstood what the Eastern Orthodox position was. Um, and so he, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't quite, you know, nail it down as to, you know, how do you differentiate between the, uh, the Roman Catholic version of the early church and the Eastern Orthodox Church? So, so my take on it, if I'm if I'm taking Brian's point of you know can we just boil this down to something something small and simple that is easy to look at, um, I think uh, it does come down to the person, the bishop of of Rome. Um, I think it, it is right to that degree. He he is kind of the linchpin because this is this is what ends up breaking the unity the unity of that uh, of the Eastern and Western churches, church at the time into two different churches. Um, if, if you'll grant me that sort of language, I, I can, I can sense the, uh, all the, all the Eastern Orthodox guys going, there are no such thing as churches. There's just church. 
There's only one. There only has been. There only ever will be. Um, and I grant that. But you know what I mean. Um, the, uh, the, the Bishop of Rome took unilateral action, altered the Nicene Creed, which was unalterable, uh, except perhaps by virtue of ecumenical council. But it, it was declared anyone who, who altered it um, was anathematized. And the Pope did it to himself. You know, the Pope took on uh, powers that are not found in the early church, it took a, a primacy of honor, a primacy of love that was indeed granted by councils, by custom, uh, which is, is pretty clear when you look at the Second Ecumenical Council, the Third Ecumenical Council, the way the Eastern churches treated him. It's very clear from the beginning they understood him to have a primacy but not a supremacy. Um, and that the position of the Bishop of Rome, while oftentimes, uh, oftentimes a bulwark against heresy, was not universally that way, held that be that way, um, and that, that there was no reason to say the, the Church of Rome cannot uh, apostatize from the faith. Um, certainly it can be. Um, and, uh, you know, you can even see, you know, you can even see that, um, I think there's a reasonable case to be made to say, if you, if you just look at, um, at the way Paul writes to the Romans, uh, um, in the letter of Romans, this, this is oftentimes easily missed. But, but Paul is talking to the church of Rome specifically in the book of Romans and tells them that they can be grafted out of the church. And oftentimes we read Romans and we, we are, we're reading it in a personal sense in a way that it just applies to me, which is fine because it does. Um, but we forget the original audience. Paul is writing to the church of Rome and he tells them they can be grafted out. Okay. So there's no way that this fits in with current Roman ecclesiology. Their idea of the church is that the, that the Bishop of Rome and the, and the, the Bishop Rick, I guess, as it were, the church at Rome is, is essential to the makeup of the church. There is no church that doesn't have as a constituent member, the church of Rome this this body of believers there that it's uh it's been granted a special position that makes it indefectible it cannot be um be in in schism from the church because it more or less is the touchstone of the church and particularly the bishop of rome that this bishop of rome can't teach error um, which is obviously untrue as i've talked about with honorius uh, ecumenical council it begs to differ it says he can teach error and did teach error um, and, uh, and I, I think any person who, who would want to kind of boil it down and say, where is the kind of the tight argument, the easy way to understand the difference? That's it. Um, you know, look at, look at what happened. The Bishop of Rome changed the creed, didn't have the right to do that. Um, he created the schism. It wasn't the Eastern Orthodox churches that created the schism. It was the Bishop of Rome that did it. And, um, and, uh, and he, he, he didn't have the right to do that. Um, and it's quite clear from, you know, a reading of, of early church history. Check out the, the Dvornik book, Francis Dvornik. Um, as I said, guy's a Roman Catholic, but he gives a, a pretty fair take on it. And look at the way he talks about the constituency of the church, the way it was understood to, to be put together. And, and, and I think it's pretty clear, um, that, uh, that, that the Eastern church was not at fault for the way things uh, broke apart. And the current understanding of the, of the place of the Bishop of Rome is just unworkable. And that's pretty much the end of the video. Um, the rest of it, I've trimmed off the end, is uh, more of a rehash of a little bit more from Brian's first video. And I've already responded in my first response and in the second response, I've said everything I care to say about that. So I'm just going to, to leave that there. Um, I do like Brian's general approach. He's trying to find a way to boil down the issues and make it easy for people to navigate this um, in the sense that he's saying, here's my own personal journey. Here's why I chose to go the way I did. And here's how I'm going to, you know, slim it down and make this understandable, you know, and I'm sure that the reality of his journey probably extended quite a bit further than just, you know, 
here's this one little thing. Uh, I'm sure he did a lot of reading, a lot of talking, a lot of praying about that. So he's, he's boiling down and trying to make it accessible. It's a great approach. I just think he unfortunately had a bad, a bad understanding of, of what the actual issues were. And uh, hopefully I've managed to give some additional clarity. I think there's excellent reason to say um, the Bishop of Rome was in the wrong here. Um, you, you, you can look back and see the church of the first millennium, see the way that it operated, see the way that it dealt with problems, uh, the way the Eastern and the Western halves interacted with each other. Um, and even look at the place of the Bishop of Rome, um, understanding the nuance that the Bishop of Rome, uh, was the first among equals. He did have a place of primacy was very important to the early church. Um, and, 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 and be able to see that and yet not at the same time immediately identify it with um, uh, Roman Catholic understandings that, that uh, in reality are are from the last you know 100 150 it's it's Vatican one uh, you know level level things in the 1800s where the Bishop of Rome is declared to, to you know have this charism of infallibility and um, and you know, they, they have uh, imposed a certain understanding of the place of the Bishop of Rome that just doesn't work with history. Um, you can just find too many examples uh, of the Bishop of Rome not acting in accordance with this and the rest of the church not treating him as if this were actually part of his essential makeup. It's, it's almost as if these charisms of the Holy Spirit only appear in the 1800s. They don't seem to be present in the early church. You can't find ex cathedra type statements, um, which again is it's almost kind of it's almost kind of funny to watch um, people who are Catholic apologists. When you start quizzing them on things like you know well, what are ex cathedra statements? Can you can you give me a list of them? What and you, and you'll get a gajillion different lists of which ones are you know which statements are supposedly you know, actually, you know, infallible statements. Um, and it's usually a pretty small list is the one that people, the ones that people actually want to try to defend. Um, but you don't find, you don't find ex cathedra statements in the, in the early church. And the early church doesn't seem to have any, any interest in getting these sorts of statements from the Bishop of Rome, which to my mind, uh, it completely invalidates the entire understanding of the Roman Catholic Church of the Bishop of Rome. Um, if the Bishop of Rome is actually essential in his function to the way the church is constituted, how it determines doctrine, um, if, if that is actually the case, there should be some signs of this in the first millennium. There's not. There just isn't. The Bishop of Rome uh, plays an important part in many uh, of the controversies, as you would expect, of the leading bishop of the Christian church. If he was somehow completely mysteriously absent from all these dis all these discussions, you would think something's really weird. So you expect to see the Bishop of Rome involved in these things. You also expect to see the Bishop of Constantinople and the Bishop of Antioch and the Bishop of Alexandria. Why? Because they were the major parts of the the Christian church of the first millennium. These are these are the big wigs. You know, all of them should be involved. And guess what? All of them are. Um, and yet none of them, including the Bishop of Rome, um, uh, enjoy a place of papal infallibility. No one ever, ever asks the Pope. I think this is, this is, you know, the crux of the issue. Look in the first millennium <clears throat> and look in, and see where you can find the early church looking for uh, infallible statements of doctrine from the Pope. You just won't find it. Um, nor will you find the Pope exercising universal jurisdiction. Um, you'll find, you'll find some quote mining and you'll find some, some, it, you know, uh, some, some, you know, very, very, very grandiose statements, but that's about it. Uh, hopefully some of this was useful to you and, um, and I don't know, maybe other videos come at some other time, but I think as far as, as my, my responses to Brian, uh, these are over. So, uh, good luck and, uh, go, go read some books.